Now our next unit is project schedule management. This was previously called time management, project time management, but what we understand now about the modern project is that we really don't manage time. Time is time and we have to deal with that time as it crosses a global spectrum and maybe even internationally or interstellar at some point. So we deal with schedules, schedules we can handle. Those are committed units of time that we say we're available and we're committed to do certain things. So we look at a schedule management concept in the PMI structure. So, here we have processes. We have plan schedule management. We have define our activities. We have sequence those activities. We have estimate the activity's duration. How long will it take? Develop the schedule and then control the schedule. Now, remember in a previous lecture I talked about that we deal with nouns with the work breakdown structure. It's a easy and we all do this. We all take the idea of work and we make it activity. I am doing something. I am being something. I am creating. I am uh, hammering. I am uh, writing, I am programming, I am testing. Those are the verbs. Remember when I talked about the work breakdown structure? Remember I said it was noun centric, it was things. In the work breakdown structure, we want to look at the things we are creating the deliverables that are the result of our work, those products and services that either in themselves or a conglomerate of them create that product. Here, we're looking at what actions do I need to take in order for those things to be created, those nouns, those objects to be created because now we're going to look at activity and activity is explicitly, implicitly, and absolutely based on a time frame. We only have 24 hours a day. That is an absolute. So we have to look at how to put the work we need to do in a structure that allows us to be successful. Project schedule management allows us to create that structure. And we create it by looking at these processes, planning the schedule management, defining the activities, sequencing them, estimating their duration, developing the schedule, and controlling that schedule. We work with this and it is linear. It is step by step by step by step. There are times when we will break this, but we need to look at it as if it was a linear process so that we can wrap our hands around the necessary ingredients to it. And once we do that, then we can say we need something else. Here's the example. If you're a chef, there is a specific recipe for how to do a souffle. Now, if you've had a souffle, you understand what I'm saying. If you haven't, it's basically a lot of magic with eggs and milk and, and butter and you can add other ingredients like chocolate and or spinach, not together, generally. Cheese, it's a wonderful thing. But it's a wonderful thing because we have sequenced the ingredients together in the right proportions. So what we're talking about 
is not really doing a souffle because there are a lot of other moving parts that we, we deal with in our typical project. But this allows us to understand our goal is the souffle. Our goal is the project's objective, that product, that service that we want to deliver to the stakeholders, to the sponsor, to the customer, whatever the definition is. This will allow us. This is extremely important, which is why you hear me talking passionately about it. This, I absolutely believe that if you get a proper definition of what it is you're trying to deliver and you break it into the proper components, which is what the work breakdown structure is, and then we look at these components and we look and see how these come together and we control that schedule, then we can do what we've said from the beginning hit the triple constraint, being on scope, on schedule, on budget. But that's not, that is not possible if we don't understand what it is and now how do we get there. It's, it, it really is conceptually easy to say, I'd like to do X, Y, Z. I'd like to build a movie that has aliens from a different galaxy come visit us. Sounds good. And I'd like it to be a Western-themed kind of movie with great special effects. Well, conceptually, that may be easy for us to say, and we can sit down and talk about it, but as I've said before, the devil's in the details. Making it happen is where project managers make their money. It's where companies succeed and fail. The reason that project management is so important in our daily life and in our world and in our corporate structures and in our government structures is because we try and create structure from the chaos that sometimes surrounds us. With project schedule management, what we are doing is we're saying, you've given me what you want, a work breakdown structure. It may be in great detail, but now we have to put it in the real world where we only have 24 hours a day, where we have to get things done, not just thought about. So that's where schedule management comes in. The first process that we deal with is the planned schedule management. The, there's a recurring theme here with our, our methodologies. You'll see we always go back to that, okay, it's a project management plan and components will come into it. We plan scope. We've already talked about planning the stakeholders. Now we're gonna plan schedule. Inputs include the project management plan, not surprising. We also have the project charter because we still need to keep in, in, in an understanding of that higher level Charter, what are we trying to do, who's involved, what are the, the uh, constraints, what are our assumptions, big things that we need to just kind of keep in mind. Realize that project documentation are not things to be filed. I have a love-hate relationship with my file cabinet, and I have a couple of them in my office. And that love-hate relationship is, I know that I need to file some things away so that I can keep up with them and I don't lose them. But the problem with a filing cabinet, and it can be, I'm old school, 
um, no gray hair. So I have a filing cabinet which pieces of paper go into folders and get slid into slots. But we do the same thing with our computers now. We file things away. We put things away. And with our file uh, sharing softwares that we use, our collaborative tools that are used, this becomes even more important to understand that we need to have information that is available to us and accessible to us when we need it. it it's not lost. Uh, okay. It's lost until we find it. I love the, the, the old story and, it, and it's almost legendary. Where did you find your keys finally? The last place I looked. And the laugh there is, if you kept looking for your keys after you found them, you probably aren't very smart. The point of the story is we always find things the last place we look for them if we found them. In modern corporate organizational structures, we need to have a way of being able to find things quickly. Organization is, is imperative. And it doesn't need to be one structure commands all. But as a project manager, as a project manager, you need to know where things are. Part of this planning of schedule management is it's very important for us to know where we keep things. And so we go back to our previous plans. What have we recorded in the project management plan? What have we looked at in our charter? Has it changed at all? Do we have better ideas? So I, I take a moment to remind you of the dynamic nature of what we do. And it's not that you don't understand that on some level, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves, okay, I have to look back as I move forward and I have to plan so that I can find what I've already thought through so that I don't have to think through it again. Another input are enterprise environmental factors. If we look at the in enterprise environmental factors, our organizational process assets, which are our inputs here, a lot of what is in those documents, information, whatever is recorded there for your specific project in your specific organization, a lot of that are those things we don't want to forget. We don't want them lost or misplaced. I mean, I, you don't lose your keys. I didn't lose them. I just can't find them. Right? Now, I, I will admit I did find my keys one time in the freezer. And why I thought that was a good place to keep my car keys, I have no idea to this day. But they were there. The point of a lot of what we talk about as inputs into this process are the things that we need to keep up with, we need to keep organized, we need to keep a sense of being the custodians of this information. And if we're not, we need to know who is and we need to have an expectation of them that this information is available and readily accessible. It doesn't help us to know that somebody has created a 10,000 page document that has completely uh, put into words our organizational process assets. If 
we can't get to it because it's deemed as outside our authorization or our whatever. We're not on the org chart or something. Keep these things in mind. I'm hoping to remind you of some of the frustrations that we have gone through as, as practical project professionals, project managers, maybe other roles with different titles, and it doesn't matter. We've gone through these things. I'm trying to give you words and little stories and understandings to help you hang on to the concepts that we're dealing with here. Now, to plan the schedule management, tools, expert judgment. Again, your expectation is you're an expert or you can find the experts. Find the information within your organization or outside your organization if need be. I've dealt with small companies and in, in small companies, sometimes you don't have all the experts around, but you bring them in. I remember even at a larger company like uh, Bell South Cellular, a cellular company, nine states, there was a PhD in mathematics brought in to do some specific work, and he was paid a whole lot of money to do it. Why? I looked at his results and, and he and I chatted and, it, and I'm smiling at you right now in my voice and, and looking at you and I'm, I'm saying I could have done the math he did and he knew I could have done the math he did but he was brought in for his expertise value. Sometimes you bring in people from the outside so that there's no question to their validity. They are the expert. We brought them in. We paid them money. The results of their work is expertise. Whether or not we absolutely believe that all the time is not the point. It's a natural human thing to do. It's what people do. I don't know how to do this. I'll ask Joe over the fence if he's ever planted begonias. Now, Joe may not know, but my sense of getting an expert from someplace else to help me understand it or to get me off the hook from doing it wrong in some way is part of what we deal with. So just understand, Expert judgment is an important piece of, of what we do. And, and I'll touch upon this as, as we move through the different lectures. So you're going to hear different ideas about expert judgment. But it pops up. And I hate for you to see that, okay, here's the tool. Now it's expert judgment. Okay, let's just file it over here because I hear it all the time. Don't do that. Always keep in mind that every knowledge area we deal with, every process that we talk about may be the most vital thing to your project. So we can't minimize it. We can't take it and put it as, um, well, we do that all the time. Too much of our life we do that. And, and I'll talk some about that when we deal in communications. Um, that may seem like a strange place, but just put a footnote on that, write it down on a sheet of paper going, huh? What? We'll get there. Expert judgment, one of our tools. Next one, analytic techniques. Makes sense. We have data. We know what we're trying to do at this point. We should have a clue with the work breakdown structure of what it is we're trying to deliver in a broken down decomposed way so we know the pieces that it will take to build the car or to build the application or to build whatever it is we're building. Then we use analytic techniques to take those pieces and go, what's the best way to move forward with this? How do we make this thing, noun, 
happen? What actions have to be taken place? What actions? Now, understand, we're not talking about who does what yet. Who does what will happen. We will talk about it. This is part of that, we're breaking this whole project management into pieces when in reality, when you walk in first day, a lot of it you're trying to do all at once. The idea here is to give you specific pieces to work on and give you a sequence to look at so that you can keep things in order not that they come to you in order, not that they should be in order, not that they should be in order, but because you have to make yourself successful, putting things in order helps. I love to cook. And when I cook, I might start with a recipe or not. I might start with a hot pan and look in the fridge. Depends on what I'm cooking. In project management, it depends on what you're trying to do. If I'm doing a souffle, I'm a lot more orderly than if I'm doing a stir fry. Though both of them have rules and regs that I have to deal with to make sure it comes out right. But let me tell you, I heard at one point early in my career, 20 years ago, that project management was like baking. Here's the recipe, just follow the recipe. Project management is as far from baking as possible, unless you're a really good baker. Because a really good baker knows that if I take a recipe and I go someplace of a high altitude, my recipe won't work. Or if I take substandard ingredients, why? Because I have them here, then it won't work. You have to marry skill sets and experience together. Analytic techniques help you pull this stuff together, understand what am I doing, how do I do it, uh, what, how long does things take, how long does it take to write code or to put together a testing plan. Those things are important. Yeah, meetings. We always meet. Remember my rule on meetings and we'll talk more about meetings. So our outputs are our schedule management plan. Realize we're not doing any scheduling yet. Not one thing is on a schedule. You may have 15 distinct items that you have to create in order for your project to be successful. But you haven't scheduled them yet. You just put together the plan to schedule. You figured out what are the factors I need inputted in this. What are these things? I've decided on the, the project management plan. We have the charter, we have the environmental factors, we have the organizational process asset, assets. We're going to use, we've decided that expert judgment, analytic techniques, and meetings are going to be needed. And then we put together the schedule management plan. How am I going to approach it? Now, I've talked longer in this particular lecture than some of you will take to actually put your schedule management plan together. And why would that be? And you think about it. You already know what your, envir your enterprise environmental factors are or your organizational process assets, or you know your templates that you use within your project management office, within your organization. So you have a clue how this is going to be put together. You know what, what resources to bring together in order to meet what analytic techniques that you use that are accepted within your organization. 
And maybe you don't think you need any others, so you stay with those particular analytic techniques. It's all different, and it can take a short time or a longer time. When we talk through it here, it's for you to understand that you shouldn't just start doing the scheduling. You should figure out how it should be done. Think of it as, as driving to a location. Do you get in the car, start it, move forward, or do you move backwards? Why would you choose that? Well, in my driveway, I park with my the front end of my car to my garage because I don't get a space in there. And I back out of my driveway. So if I'm going anywhere in my vehicle, I have to back out of my driveway. Well, that's a specific kind of thing I have to do and I am making choices and some of these are very normal choices. One of the points of project management and, and, and this type of methodology is to get you more conscious of those choices. Think about them. What would happen if I drove forward? Well, in that case, it would probably not be a good thing because I'd crash into my garage. But are you making that choice because you've always done it or because it's the right thing for this project? We're talking about scheduling here. So when we talk about this, we're, we're talking specifically about putting together the plan of how we're going to schedule it, who I need to be involved, what expert opinions, what techniques, what meetings, etc. Our next process that we're really dealing with is the define activities part. We're going to define the activities. Now, this is different than defining what it is we're trying to do. We're defining the activities it takes to do it. It's one thing to know I want to win a game. It's another thing to know that I've got to hit a home run in order to win it. Our projects are not that dramatic, but the point is actions are different than the results that they, you get out of them. We first deal with the results. Now we're dealing with the actions. Inputs here are our schedule management plan because we figured out how we're looking at the schedule, how we're managing it, how we're planning it, all of those details we've thought through. They may be given to us or they may be something we had to create from scratch. Then we look at our scope baseline. What's our scope baseline? I'll give you a minute. What is the scope baseline? If you don't remember what I've said before, it's okay. What do you think it is? A baseline is what we initially think the what looks like. We typically use the work breakdown structure as that baseline. That is what we have said. We've broken it into components. And we've said that these are the components that we need to do the things that need to be delivered, products or services, in order for us to be successful. That's necessary for us to figure out what it is we have to do, the actions, the activities, the things that have to happen in order for the project to be delivered on time, on scope, on budget. Next, we have are enterprise environmental factors. I told you early on in early lectures that we will talk about these a lot. I don't want to minimize them. They're always present in what we're doing. And, and just a side note, 
understand that a lot of these inputs and outputs and the tools and techniques, just because we mention them here, they're not absolutes. If you don't pull in your envir you know, enterprise environmental factors, or if those are not well defined within your environment, your, your enterprise, your organization may not have that well defined for you. So you're trying to create that or understand that as you go. That's okay. But in when we talk about formalizing project management, which is what all the certification is, is, is truly about, there is an understanding that a value is placed on certain elements, one of which is the enterprise environmental factors. Another is the organizational process assets, which we see here. They may or may not be something that you have ready access to or think you do, but you can't ask about them. Our tools and techniques, we use, again, decomposition. That means we're breaking things apart. So how does that work here? It means that we're taking the things that need to be done, the individual components that, it, that will represent the product or service that we're delivering as our project's uh, end delivery, our deliverable, and we're breaking it into pieces. If you're making a house, what's that house made of? Those individual components are part of the work breakdown structure, but then how do I deliver those components are broken down one step further. So you may know I need a roof, but what actions have to be taken for me to get a roof? Well, I have to order the material that goes on the roof. And because I don't want it to leak, there's probably material that goes on top of the material. And there's probably some requirements that say what that roof looks like. Is it flat? Is it angled? If you've, if you've never built a house, here's a lesson. I built one once. And we were told my wife and I, that the roof in our bedroom would be vaulted, a vaulted ceiling. So when you walk in during the midst of construction and you see that the ceiling in your bedroom is flat, and this was a house that we built, we basically built on spec, and we didn't actually have to close on it until after it was already, already completed. But we were deep in it. I mean many years ago. The point is that as you deconstruct, you have to understand where that roof has to be so the ceilings are right, so that the house is acceptable to the final client stakeholder who's going to cut the check to make you successful. Now maybe you specifically are in charge of it or not, but the process is the same. Irregardless of your personal responsibility. So, in defining activities, understanding what has to be part of that is important. And decomposing it into its pieces, I need a roof. I need it to be an angle. I need it to tie in to a ceiling. I need it to have certain regulatory elements so it doesn't burn up or have issues or be substandard in any way, shape, or form. So, Another uh, tool or technique, and we'll talk about this in, in a little bit more detail, is uh, the rolling wave planning. This is a technique, project management is not a new 
field. Remember, we've been building things since we put two rocks together and when we started building huts and whatever. I mean, people have built pyramids, cathedrals. There was no formal project management until a few short years ago. Order of mag I say that a few short years ago. Order of magnitude is probably best guess is we weren't talking about this formally since the early 60s, maybe the mid 50s. Sometimes we look at it as the 40s. It depends on how you define it. And I'm not going to go into detail about the history of project management right here, but understand that we borrowed different techniques, borrowed tools. You'll start seeing them now. We've done some relatively straightforward tools. Those were borrowed too. You have heard in earlier lectures about the uh, RACI chart. That didn't exist strictly for project management. There are other tools we've talked about, and we will talk about far many more as we work through this, this curriculum, this, this class. Rolling Wave is one of them, and we'll talk about it. Didn't, did it come out of project management specifically? It, it, my point is it doesn't matter. If it did, great. Didn't, it doesn't matter. We borrow tools into our profession that work for us. Let me say that again. We borrow, procure, acquire, bring in tools, techniques that help us be successful. This particular certification that we're dealing with has done that exceptionally well because they pulled from a lot of different fields including technical fields and human behavior fields and other fields of, of planning that were outside of what was strictly looked at as project management. We have mathematical models some of them are going to be very familiar, and some of them will probably not. You need to be familiar with all of them to get the certification. You may not use any of them. And what I caution you in this piece of the lecture is do not reject them because you don't use them right now. And you may be a project manager who's worked for years and years in the field and you feel like you've never used them and never will because in your industry, they're non-existent. Breathe. It's okay. Because you're not trying to be successful only in your field as you listen to me, you're trying to be successful in passing a certification. And the governing organization is, is interested in your broad-based understanding of the tools, techniques, the inputs and outputs, the general feel of all the processes that you would go through, the knowledge areas you need to be aware of. And here, Rolling wave planning, we'll talk about that shortly. We'll also use expert judgment, which you already know you are the experts. Our outputs in this, we get an activities list. Now, what's an activity list? An activity list is what it takes to bring the things that we've identified the items, the processes, the products, the services that we have said we need to bring about to be successful within this project. We have the attribute. So we understand more than just a list. You need to do X. Well, what does that mean? That's an attribute. It's like more explanation. 
Will it be long? Sometimes, but not always. Sometimes it's easy. You know, you need to put 16 nails into that board to make sure it's secured. That's your activity. Well, the attribute may be they're 12 penny nails. It's a two by four or two by six. Activity attributes may be specific. They may not, they may reiterate what's been said within the work breakdown structure, or they may be unique. Both happen. It's just more information. You have milestone lists. What's a milestone? We'll talk in detail about this um, and understand that a milestone is something that's important. We, we look at milestones in our personal lives all the time. Graduating from college or high school, graduating uh, or, or getting married, having a child, those are generally looked at as milestone events. And what that means is that you've crossed a certain level. In our corporate organizational lives, it's not as monumental, but it's important. Let me say that again. It's not as monumental, but it's important that we understand them. It can be our milestone is that I have gone from developing an application to handing it over to testing. It could be that I'm a business analyst and I have built and I've elicited requirements and built my requirements document. I've started my requirements traceability matrix and I'm handing that information over to a designer or developer. And that's a milestone. I'm done, move on on. Think about it. It's the same thing. I'm graduated from high school. Move on. Now, are there plans of what to do after that event happens? Of course. That's what we're talking about. But the list of milestones note those significant events in which we're going to go, yep, we got there. Or no, they are binary. That means they're either done or not. One O, binary comes from programming. Either it's on or it's off. One O. Either you've done it or you haven't. Some people who are used to dealing in fuzzy logic, meaning not real straightforward logic, may find this a little bit difficult, but just bear with me. It's kind of those, we deal in project management and in this particular thing of dealing with milestones, best practices, what everybody believes in that has worked on this, you really want your milestones to be binary. You don't want 50% done a milestone. Now, you can have a percentage done on the tasks that when completed, that milestone will be achieved. Hear the difference. You could be 50% done the activities necessary for the milestone to be achieved. I can be halfway through my to-do list before my daughter gets married. I could be halfway through my list of the activities I need to do to publish a book to send it to the publisher. I've noted as a milestone that sending it to the publisher is a milestone in this greater project. 
So it, think of them when you're dealing in, in, in companies as activities may be in process and have a certain uh, percentage complete. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail, but just think of it as percentage complete. And milestones are either complete or they're not. You know, it's one of those, those things. Nobody is, you know, sort of dead. You're either dead or you're not. And we're not going to go into whatever. These analogies, sometimes people go, and I'm like, just accept the normal idea of what we're talking about. Either, either you are in Georgia or not. And I use that analogy because I know of a place in Georgia where you can stand on the line. For our sake, for the sake of projects and not being difficult, always consider a milestone as being binary. We can always come up with some exceptions, but you don't want to. Why? You're trying to be successful. A milestone allows you to say, we're done. We're moving forward. And that's what is, is important here. Because moving forward means we're getting closer to success. Projects are about being successful. So it's important to understand milestones. Coming up with a milestone list in this activity is important. Now, he, here's activity decomposition. Here is a picture of cleaning a house. And let's look at this. You have, I'm going to clean the house. That's the highest level. Clean house. Clean house is a noun. A clean house. So I'm going to break this into the acti activities that it takes to clean a house. And I know this is simplistic. And I know this is not corporate oriented or organizationally oriented. But I want you to understand project management is not simply about doing things in a corporate way or an organizational way or governmental way. It, it, it has nothing to do with it. We've been doing project management from day one. So this is a decomposition. My earliest decomposition was when I was working as a very young man and I was directing something in the theater. And it was an earlier thing that I did. And I was acting as the producer director. What I had to do, I had a show that they had told me needed to open on a certain date. And what I did was backdated several times. What do I have to do the week before? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? Hear what I'm saying. What do I have to do? What has to happen? Activities. And I was doing project management even though I had never had any formal training. We do that all the time. I'm going on vacation. What do I have to do the day before? What do I have to do the week before? Mail delivery. Dog sitting. You name it. This is not... This is really not rocket science, though project management is used in rocket science. Here's our decomposition. We have this where we have we're a clean house, and we've broken it into pieces, and so we have a clean living room, clean bathrooms, clean kitchen, clean bedroom. And then we broken it into, from that point, into the vacuuming, the dusting. The clean the bathroom, clean the master bath, vacuum the living room, dust the living room. It's specific activities that have to be done in order for the major event, product. You want a clean bathroom. What do you have to do to get that? What activities? 
This could be broken down a lot further. The point here is to get you to understand how this works, this decomposition, not to try and have you uh, be able to go to the nth level on this, because you have other work to do. And I challenge you to look at the work that you're working on now and say, how could I use this concept of work breakdown structure, activity breakdown structure, and make it help me understand the work that I'm being, I'm managing or I'm doing and make it more successful. Just an example. Now here's the rolling wave planning. The idea here is it's, it's a process where you're not trying to come up with all the answers at one time. In a sense, this has an iterative kind of, of feel to it. We'll talk more in a later lecture about iterative project management. We have, there's lots that are out there. Uh, briefly, Spiral was around for a long time. Uh, Agile has been around since 2001, I believe. Uh, Scrum is a flavor of Agile. Uh, but th th we're, we'll talk about those. But this is a kind of an earlier idea. And the idea here, we have a pro it's a process for managing the project or planning it in waves. And they're talking, uh, think about rolling waves at, 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 at the ocean or on a lake where the wind's blowing and the, ro the waves come in one at a time, so you learn a little bit more every time you go through a process. So the work is done, uh, and the idea is you're trying to go high level to low level. You're trying to have the assumptions, develop some idea of the high level um, milestones that you're looking at, so it, it truly is a, an iterative situation. And um, where I would say if, if you are familiar with this, then it, it will make a, a lot of sense, obviously. If you've never heard of this, the thing to hold on to with rolling wave planning, two things, visual image of rolling waves, second image, is that you don't you 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 don't decide everything concrete at first you decide it in pieces you try and do high level to more detail so milestone list example of it is is here this slide shows you some typical um, milestones that a project might have uh, you have a, a project charter sign-off, and I have the statuses. So a milestone list is you, you both want the deadline and the status. So if something's complete, you want to know it. If something's delayed, that's also important because you want to know the things that are uh, moving slower than, than you thought. We're talking schedules here. Schedules are all about having things on time. And every project I know has issues with things being delivered on time. Doesn't matter how good the project manager is or how well organized the company is or how defined the project is. Things will happen. Real people doing real things in real time. Things happen. So, this is an example. You probably have seen a chart like this before, so it shouldn't be remarkable. We have the project charter sign-off, which happens at a date, and it's complete. Then we have the kickoff meeting. It's complete. Requirement sign-off. So someplace between January 30th and April 2nd, there have been requirements gathered, reviewed, and now they're signed off. The milestone list does not have the entire activities list, nor does it have the WBS. Typically what project managers do is they insert 
milestones within their either work breakdown structure or work breakdown structure and activities breakdown structure, which uh, most project managers have embedded together and they use tools like MS Project or uh, any number of things that can have that information together. So that's what this is looking at. So if you look at it from this view as a milestone list, and we're going back here, we see that the kickoff meeting completed the end of January, but the requirement sign-off was not until the 1st of April. Well, what that tells you is that there was a assumed set of activities that should have happened, but none of those activities were deemed as strong enough to be viewed as a binary gateway moving forward. Some organizations like that, some don't. Some organizations, I've been required to have milestones on a regular basis, as much as once a month, once or once or twice a month. I mean, it, it can be arbitrary-ish, if you will. Don't let that throw you. Understand that milestones are binary gateways. They're important events. They're critical events within the timeline. For instance, back to our chart, we have the project charter sign-off, January 6th. It's complete. Then we have the kickoff meeting, January 30th. It's complete. Requirement sign-off was April 3rd. It's complete, but there's a gap. There's a gap between each milestone. That doesn't mean nothing is happening. It means that activities are happening, but they're not looked at from a milestone perspective as significant enough to draw a line and say, we've gotten it done. Milestones are major events and they should be looked at that way. Some companies are very milestone driven. I have actually managed projects on milestone lists because the task list, the activity list under it was so detailed that we didn't want to try and, and look at it all the time. The specific groups working those activities, they had it under control. With a milestone list, this is a higher level. Project managers, and especially in this kind of methodology and in, in this certification that you're talking about, work on everything from very small projects that are distinct and have a single digit month, um, sometimes not very many week kind of duration, to multiple year. Everything here all the processes, the knowledge areas will work with both. You just have to be, listen to the, what is being asked when you're dealing with questions and what's being said here. It's good, solid information. It's a solid set of tools, milestone list being one of them. And this actually helps you keep up with what's going on, what is significant coming up, and then checking on the activities, the tasks behind it. Next, we have sequencing the activities. Now, this is an important thing. Remember, we, we've talked about what has to happen. I have what is the deliverable, what are the objects, what are the services we're delivering with projects. We've talked about how to deliver those projects, but now we have to figure out what has to come first. What do I do first? Now, a lot of things are obvious and, and we, we grab those and we make them obvious, but this process group is really about trying to make sure that we don't bring something in before something else needs to be done. In complex projects, a lot of moving parts, you need to be careful of that. What we're looking at here is the sequence of activities. Our inputs are our 
schedule management plan, our blueprint for how we do this. We also have our activities list. So we've list, listed everything that we think is going to happen, all the actions that are necessary, all the things, the, the, the active uh, things that we have to do in order to bring in the necessary products and service, all the components. Then we look and have the attributes, the details around those. The, the attributes can tell us and help us understand what those things are. For instance, if you are trying to pour concrete, concrete is, has a certain attribute to it. You can't do anything to it for a number of hours or days, depending on where you are, what kind of concrete it is, etc. So it's an attribute of the action, the activity of pouring concrete foundations. The same thing works in larger buildings if you're doing pillars, etc. But you get the point. Another thing is the milestone list. If we've developed a milestone list that says we need to get certain things completed by these dates, it's important for us to realize that we have this list. And the dates may not be firm. It may be targeted, meaning that we say this is our best guess of this milestone. We don't have a baseline schedule yet. That's what we're working on. So, but we have a milestone list, a list of things we want to have happen in a certain order usually, because we do think linearly. We think in terms of time. I'm going to do this first, then this, then this, then this. One of the attributes <laughs> of, of someone who has uh, attention deficit is that they have a hard time sequencing things. They jump from project to project or thing to thing or activity to activity. And, it, and what we're trying to do is avoid that in, in, in formal project management. And this is a way to do it. We have these inputs as well as a scope statement. We, this, when you look at a scope statement at this point of what we're doing, this is not to say you don't know what you're doing, you need to look at the scope statement. It's to say, go back to it, look at it, read it. It shouldn't be a 15-page document. Understand what it is and how it can fit in with what you're doing now. That's the big thing. Also, the environmental factors of the enterprise are always important, and the organizational process assets. As we go to sequence, what kind of other influences may be there? There may be vacation times. I knew of one organization I worked with that gave the entire organization um, a week off at Christmas. They closed down the entire thing. They said between this date and this date, and it, it flexed every year, they would close. So between, it was a holiday festival, whatever. And uh, they did that. If that's what people do, you need to be aware of it. There are certain uh, firms that I've dealt with in, in other foreign countries that deal with their local holiday and cultural calendars in a certain way. If they are important people within your organization or within your project that you're doing, or potentially so, even if you haven't identified them, those things need to be taken into account. So you'll have a couple of things. Precedence diagramming methodologies is one of the techniques that we use and we'll talk about. It's not something that everyone uses all the time, but it's something you need to be aware of. It's something that the certification is looking at and we'll talk about and there will be questions about. We'll also deal with dependency determination. Everybody deals with this. 
on all projects. We'll talk about how you can understand the dependencies of your projects and deal with those. Leads and lags, technical terms for how you deal within the sequencing of activities so that you get clear understanding of how long things take and when you can have some times that are more flexible within your schedule. From this, we come up with network diagrams. And a network diagram is simply a formal diagram. We'll see several pictures of them. But it's a schedule network diagram and it connects the activities together in a network where you see the dependencies, you see the sequence, and you can see how long things take, and you have multiple paths that you can look at. So you can see where you can shift resources if necessary, or you can get things done early if that's possible, but it, it's all about trying to figure out the and, and document those kinds of relationships. You also have an output of this, this process of an update of your, your documents. We're at the point now where you need to look at the project documents and, and, and what's changed. You should be doing this on a regular basis and this just points out that in, in, when we sequence the activities, it tends to be a place where we look at things very closely and project managers will look at how this may affect other documentation so that we keep everything accurate. We don't want to get disconnected between the various pieces of a project and this helps us do that. Now we have the dependency determination. What we're looking at here is activities don't happen in a vacuum. Activities happen because we're trying to get something done. So we have to figure out what the dependencies may be. And we can define them differently. It's easy to say finish A before B starts. And that is our first type of dependency. We finish A, then B starts. It's the default. It's how we think of life. You know, we finish one thing before we start another. But in real life, that's not the case. When I'm cooking, I don't start the potatoes after the roast is finished. Or in my case, in my house, if I am grilling portobello mushrooms, I don't wait until they're finished before I finish the rest of the bread or the other vegetables that are being served with it because it won't come out at the same time. Our goal is to have a dinner and it's that finished product that's important. What we'll look at in this section is how we can structure the dependencies in such a way that we get the best result we get a successful project. Finish to start is the, the go-to, no doubt. We like to finish one thing before we start another, but you can start to start. So what would start to start look like? Think about it. What types of activities could you start and then before you start the second activity? You might have one activity that you just have to kick it off before you start the next. My kitchen analogy works there. I need to start a something in the oven, perhaps, before I can start something on the cooktop or something under the broiler or something else that I need to do. So there's a lot of things that we do normally that would fit this kind of thing. Um, in corporate work, we do differently. We have different things. We might need to, we could start our design work before we start our, our uh, development work for a certain application. 
So you might need to have an idea of where you're going big picture design. What's the language, the format, the platform you're going towards before you can develop. But you might be able to start your development while you've already started your, after you've started your, your design. But the design must come first. So that might be an example. And look for these things. They're not the normal, but you need to think of what things can be done concurrently. Why? Why do we want concurrent activities and projects? It's simple. We have multiple resources we're dealing with, and we want to get things done as efficiently, meaning less money as possible. So when we look at projects and we try and sequence these things, the dependency is an important facet to it. Another type of activity and dependency is a finish to finish. I can't finish A until I finish B. Well, there you might say I have to finish a test, uh, a, a user acceptance test before I get a final sign-off. I've worked applications, and it's not atypical for you to give some look-see of the final product. And plus, the, the end user is not gonna wait until you're absolutely done and, and you've finished all your testing before they wanna know, is the product going to be a good product? Can I see it early? Can I look at prototypes or even not even prototypes, but the actual product in a semi-production, a test environment, a UAT environment? So before they'll sign off, we need to finish. But we have to finish the testing before they'll do the final sign off. The other one is a start to finish. Now, start to finish are fairly unusual, and we don't do these, uh, uh, they're not used because it's, I need to start an activity before I can finish another activity. Well, it's sort of unusual, but here's an example. I have to start the new application, the new router, the new, I can't take the old one offline before the new one is online. So I can't finish the activity of the old router until I've started the new router. So those that would be a start to finish kind of relationship. So it's a little unusual, but we need to look for these things and keep our minds open for them because it creates a way that we can manage our resources better. We can manage these activities better. And here's just, this is precedence diagramming methodologies. And here we have it. We have the finish to start, the finish to finish, just a different look at the same kinds of information. Now, we determine dependency there are mandatory dependencies. What would a mandatory dependency be? Well, it's the word. It has to happen. So if we have to, by law, start a system before another system is taken offline, think about medical records or customer records, or financial records. We must stand up the new system and prove it. And there's a dependency. We have to have it proved before we take it off, the old system off. So that would be a mandatory, has to happen. And that's, in, that's a, a mandatory dependency that's brought to us. But there may be things that are mandatory because it just makes sense. It's like I can't start building a, a framing of a house without the concrete being set. Well, the concrete takes how many days? Well, we have to have the concrete set 
for that number of days before we start building the framing. Well, can I start the roof when the concrete's done? No, what do you put the roof on? You put the roof on the framing. There are logical, mandatory dependencies in all activities. And what we're looking for in your specific projects is where those dependencies are, where those things that make logical and rational sense, where they are, and make sure that we are uh, applying that, that type of mentality to it. So if it's a mandatory dependency, it has to happen. We have no choice to it. Then there are discretionary dependencies. What's a discretionary dependency? It means we can do it or not under certain circumstances. Now, a discretionary means that we have some choice. There's some flexibility. But that's not just a binary. Well, I can choose to or not. It's not binary. It's about making the best choice, using your discretion. Remember, we keep talking about expert judgment, expert opinion, expert minds. The most powerful computer you'll have in your life is between your ears. One of the things we do as project managers, and I mention it here because in the scheduling, it gets detailed. It gets, you're working with very discreet and interesting challenges. Discretionary dependency is that. It has a choice, but making that choice is, is always difficult. It can be everything from saying, that I can start the plumbing before the wiring's in, or vice versa, for a specific house. Or I can actually start coding before the design is complete because the designer and the developer of a specific application are working so closely together. It can mean that you start testing an application or a product before it's completely finished. Those can be discretionary. We know when the prototype's done, we're gonna do some testing, and that testing could hold for the entire product line. Now, it may not, but there's a discretionary, a choice in this dependency. Now, you can have external dependencies, again, something from the outside. You may be told you will not start this house before this date. Now, why would that happen? Why would someone who's building houses say, you cannot start a house before the first of the year? Well, they may not want to spend money until a certain date. Remember, real things happening in real time. So maybe there's other factors that you don't know coming from the outside in. It could be a governmental external thing that they are saying that we will have no more houses built in this area for the next six months because of environmental factors. You never know. The point is, understand in the methodology that we have to take into account various dependencies that can affect the activities we're doing. So external dependencies mean externally generated. Someone from outside yourself, your organization, maybe outside your company is generating them. It could be just outside of your organization. Uh, and one last example is the, the fact that you don't put code in in certain industries during certain times of the year. Well, why? Wireless industry sells most of their contracts and phones during the holiday seasons. That was traditionally the way it was. I haven't seen the numbers in a few years, so I could be a little out of date. But back 
in when I was working heavily in that industry and dealing with billing systems and point of sale systems and and commissioning systems, it was the rule of 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 the organization. You did not drop code during the holiday seasons, meaning somewhere between November 1 till mid-January, because that's when all the phones and contracts were being sold and they didn't want to introduce any potential outages during that time. They didn't want the customer experience to be at risk. And so they had a government lockdown of code for this period of time. And you could put fixes in, but they had to be strictly and reinforced and and approved by certain levels of of the corporate structure. So that was a dependency. We were dependent on that activity. We could not do it without certain guidelines, and it was externally imposed upon us. We didn't impose it. Someone else did. And it was the right thing to do. Just because it's external doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because it's internal doesn't mean it's right. You have to keep in mind, we're just trying to define the types of things right now that you need to look for when you're putting together your schedule and understanding the dependencies between the various activities. Internal dependencies, again, something that's dependent internally. You might have a a situation where your internal unit has a specific resource that's going on vacation for one reason or another, and it can be a dependency that you have to take into account. No work will be done in that area if they have a very specific, specialized area during that time. That's a dependency. All holiday schedules within a unit, a business unit, are internally dependent. You are dependent on that, understanding who's doing what when. Uh, and if and we haven't, we're, we're not at resources yet, but you have to keep resources in mind when you're looking at schedule. It could be that the schedule is, as I put before, that a company has a, a group of holidays that it takes off and it will not move from that. So those can be uh, internally dependent. It's coming from your own business practices, your own way of doing business, the environmental, enterprise environmental factors. Estimate activity duration. We're going to look at how we can know how long an activity would take. And we take information from various things, as we always do in this, in every process. We're going to get our inputs, we're going to use our tools, we're going to get our outputs. So we, our input, our schedule management plan is where we start with because it tells us how we're going to be doing this. It sort of outlines the process. Then we get our activities list, what it is we're trying to do. Remember, the activities list is based on the work breakdown structure. So what are we trying to do? How are we trying to do it? The attributes will direct us in some of the refining of the durations. We need to understand that and we'll look at some specific techniques that are a part of project management and and just, they're things that we always know um, in, in regular life, but we have terms for them, we look at them, but the attributes help drive that. We'll look at resource requirements here. The activities will have some resource requirements. We're not talking about the resources yet. Right now, the way that this certification, this understanding of project management, and that's a better way of of looking at this, we're understanding project management. And we're looking at it from a activity we've gone, what are we doing? How are we doing it now? 
Who do we need? What are those requirements? The activity resource requirements are key because if you're trying to build a rocket ship and you have no rocket scientists, you may have an issue. All projects are that way. We just don't have that straightforward way of saying it sometimes. And some companies think that they can build a rocket ship no matter if they have rocket scientists or not. So you need to understand that this is an important part of successful projects. Calendars. Again, we're dealing with resource calendars. We, we'll deal with resources on a separate lecture, but understand everyone has a calendar. And the calendars are not simply uh, what someone's calendar that they would keep on their desk or part of their email system or whatever. This is not their vacation calendar. It's also things like if you have resources that have conferences to go to, that have uh, that are are part of other projects that you need to take account of. This is a more complex thing, but it's a generalized way of stating it. You need to know that if you have to do this project, you have a clue now. You're trying to build a successful plan from start to finish. We're dealing with schedules. We're dealing with activities. Who are the available resources? What is their calendar? And that's what you need to bring in. The scope statement, again, I cannot emphasize this enough. And you can fast forward through the next 15 seconds if you want to. Read the scope statement regularly. If you disagree with it as the project manager, raise your hand, state it, make it known. Risk register, we'll talk about risk in a whole different lecture and it will be fully and completely. This particular methodology that we're talking about is really understands risk. They want you to be a risk manager uh, as a project manager. And I don't mean that in any negative way. I mean that in the most positive way. They want you to look at what might happen. Negative and positive. They want, want you to be able to put good information together for both of those scenarios. So when we pull it in here, again, we're not linear completely right now. Sometimes we are dealing with risk as a separate line item and we understand what's going on with our risk earlier than this may happen on a timeline. We're still dealing with what's happening in the durations. This process is estimating the activity durations. But if we have a risk register available, use it. Again, reminder, not all the inputs exist all the time for every project. Not all the outputs exist all the time for every project. Not all the tools and techniques exist all the time for every project, but it's okay. We, we are trying to do a superset, a larger grouping of the materials so that it, it can encompass because we're not here simply to give you a checkbox. We're here to make you successful in what you do to make your company, your organization more successful through your efforts. Resource breakdown structure. Again, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit later. It's a very good thing. We, we've talked about a work breakdown structure, right? You, you do remember work breakdown structure, scope management, resource 
breakdown structure is similar in that it's a hierarchical structure that says who's doing what. Our enterprise environmental factors are hugely important here. They're so important it just runs over my slide. I look over here at my slides and I'm like, oh, we're just bleeding. And the organizational process assets, I had to say that before I put that one in. Realize uh, huge amounts of factors should be coming into your world by the time you are estimating activity duration. One of the things that is frustrating for many project managers is talked about on, uh, on the internet, on, on in, in, in private and in public, is the idea that we're expected to understand a project in a lot of detail before we can. We, we don't know enough. We haven't enough information. And when you look at the inputs in this, and you look at what all we can take into account when we're dealing with duration, understand we're, we're dealing with a lot, of inf a lot of potential information that can absolutely change the direction of a project. This is where we start feeling that weight that all of us who have been project managers have felt because we are important persons within the corporate structure, within organizational structures. And this is a place where I personally feel we see it because I've been asked for estimates. You know, how long will this take? And I'm asked for it so early with so little information that it's frustrating. The methodology, the, the standards, the processes, the knowledge that we're trying to help you understand and help you pass a, a certification on, it, it's important that you understand that, that this is what we ideally want. And we need to understand that this is not always available. Look for it. Want it. Look for it. Find it. Our tools and techniques. You're an expert. Like I just said, go for it. Find it. Look for it. Ask for it. Ask questions. Be impatient when necessary. Be patient when necessary. And keep going. But it's your expert judgment. Tied those together. Expert and patience go together. By the way. There are some experts who don't always realize that. We have our estimating. We're going to do some work with different uh, analogous estimating. And analogous, what's that word mean? I have an analogy. What does that mean? What is analogies? If I have an analogy, well, I've been using them for every lecture I teach because I tell stories. Stories are analogies. I give you an example or a situation that you can hopefully take some of the information back and tie it to what I'm talking about in another situation. Those are analogies. We use analogies all the time. We say, well, I was building, some, I was building a house that's this big before, then it should cost this much or it should take this long or it should whatever. That's an analogy. It took this crew X number of times to do a certain thing, X number of days to build a certain piece of something, uh, a 
Maybe it is a testing effort with software. Maybe it's an engineering effort where you're doing very specific calculations and you have a very specific crew that you know needs to work it. You can use analogy to have an estimate. Never forget, estimate does not mean you've committed to that, nor should it. Parametric estimating. We'll talk about that technique. I'm not even gonna go into it now because I'll tell another story and we'll just keep going. But parametric, it, it's parameters. You have parameters to it. You have different pieces that you bring together. You have three-point estimating. There's a couple of different flavors of this. And basically what we're trying to do is to go high, low, medium, and bounce it off each other. It's sort of what we do in our heads all the time. You go to the car dealership, and you have a problem. You go, the high is this, the low is this, most likely is, is something in between. And you bounce it off your head. We'll talk about that. We do it all the time, but in, in formal project management, we can ask people, what's your best guess? What's your worst case scenario? What do you think's most likely? And then we can do some calculations. Math is a wonderful tool and we do use it. It's not our enemy, it is our friend. But it's our friend if we're using it in a proper way. Always remember tools are, are dependent on the user. I love the story I was once told of somebody who said, you know, a tool is, you know, a hammer's a tool. You can take a hammer and you can beat your neighbor over the head and kill them. Or you can take a hammer or and build your neighbor a house. Was the hammer the problem? Was the hammer evil, bad? And, or good when it built the house. Tools are neutral. How we use them is where the importance of life is. And how we use these tools, these techniques, this information is what's really important. You can use them and do whatever you want to with them. I have no power. I'm just sharing with you both a set of, of information that's validated, people have seen it, men and women have used it for success. And you'll see that. You'll see that if you look out these are great tools, and we're, we're starting to get, as our lectures continue, into these tools. So I, I'm, I'm starting to talk about them because these are things that have come out of a lot of different areas, and they're good stuff. Put them in your toolbox. Remember them. You may not use them for now. You may not use them for years but they may be something that will help you and your company be successful later. Group decision-making, we've talked about group decision-making techniques a little bit before, and, and, and it's, it's still the same. There are ways that, that groups of people uh, can make decisions, and, and there are different ways. We'll talk about a few of those ways. We, we've talked some about them. And they're good things. It, it, groups can make decisions together. It's difficult. Anybody who's have a, ever had a group of people together, you know, you put 10 people in the room and say, what do you want for dinner? It's not the right w technique. Same thing happens when you're dealing with determining activities for duration sometimes. 
because you have to ask the right person the right question. That's where your expert judgment comes in. Who do you need to know what information? You're the project manager. You're in charge. That's what the charter said. So by the time you're at this piece of the project, you are fully empowered. So remember that. Empowerment is a double-edged sword, but it's a powerful tool. Reserve analysis, again, reserve analysis is something we'll talk about in detail in the risk analysis portion of this program. But it is something that is, can be very valuable, especially with projects that A, value risk analysis and risk management highly, and B, are larger because when you're talking about reserves and having the analysis and the management of risk done, it generally deals with projects that have a large amount of money. And that's the case when we talk about it and the, the questions come up. You're not gonna be asked about uh, a risk or reserve analysis or, or risk management within a project that has a small scope or small budget. It's just, we don't spend that energy Remember, we're talking about common sense, but we're talking about common sense when you're dealing with projects are, that are five and six years long with multi-billion dollar budgets, literally, to projects that are five and six months long that have hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar budgets, maybe. The techniques work for all of them. We just need to utilize the techniques, toss out what's not helping us be successful. Outputs. When we're estimating the activity durations, we have outputs of the activity duration estimates. I love doing that. We estimate activity durations, we get activity duration estimates. There you go. That's what we're trying to do. Could it be any more straightforward than that? We're trying to figure out what we're doing, how we're doing it, the activities necessary. And that's what we get from this process. We also update documents, very easy. We update doc, you should be updating documents always. Just side note, I, I go to my, there, there are two things I use and I'll talk about one a little bit later in communications and I'll talk about the other right now. One is a list of things that I have to do to update documents. As we move through a project, as we have been initiated and we keep, we move forward, there are things that we note, conversations that we have, our expert judgment that we go, aha, meetings that we learn from others. Those things can't be lost. Two ways I deal with that. One is a task list of things I need to update documents, people, subjects, you name it. I also keep a journal, and I'll talk about that in communication skills when we talk about communication management. But that's a valuable thing to remember. It pops here because we're talking about throwing a lot of information right now. The inputs the tools and techniques of trying to get the activity duration estimated can be daunting. What I want you to understand is that as 
you gather information. You need to take it and you need to document it and push it forward to the people, to the documents, to the information systems, to whatever is the appropriate place that it needs to go. And as I said, even your journal, which is your personal communication with yourself, that's what a journal is. Estimating techniques. Analogous estimates. We do this all the time. I've said before, here's an example. We want to go to a restaurant. How much is it going to cost? Well, how much does a restaurant like that cost usually? We might add some parameters to that. Who am I taking? What food do I want? It's an analogy. It's a like situation in which we pull information to give us a clue. Is it direct? Is it specific? No. We've all gone places that we thought we knew what we would spend and we end up getting the special and they end up doing something else. But here we're talking about getting an analogy from prior information that should be a bit more specific why? Because we're not talking about your memory only. We're talking about the memory of the company. Remember the list that we talked about. Enterprise, environmental factors, organizational process assets, all of that, plus what you've discovered so far. You might be able to pull the specific bill rate of an a a um, developer, or a tester, or a contractor. Depends on the project. All of them are important, and all of them are specific, but you may be able to pull that. So now we're trying to find estimates of the activities that need to happen. And, and this is, a, the analogy is just finding out what happened before and, and relating it to what I'm doing now. And don't, remember expert judgment is in this. So if it, there are specific differences, when I take my wife out for dinner on a Friday night, middle of, of, of the month, nothing special, I might say, well, we'll spend X dollars. If I take her out on her birthday, there are special circumstances and I might think differently. How does that work in corporate? That, that, that's nice, we, we love to hear, I know you love to hear about what I do. Corporate, I have an application that's being upgraded. Typically, an upgrade that lasts six months will cost $2 million. So, I go, what's the differences between this typical upgrade that costs $2 million and takes this long and what you're doing now? And it's the differences that I might add into this, which leads me to Parametric estimating, which is when you put together a set of factors. So it's not just saying, you just do it before, let's get an estimate. It's saying, what's happened? What are the different pieces? It can be something like, if I'm doing, you've estimated that it's going to take 10,000 lines of code to do this, and 10,000 lines of code cost this much and are going to take this long. Yes, I've crossed over a bit. What did I say? It cost this much and it lasted this long. 
I'm acknowledging that I'm starting to move into our next knowledge area because it's almost impossible not to. Our estimating techniques for schedule will move into cost. It's important for you to understand that because in most of our environments, they do. People talk about cost and not schedule or schedule and not cost or both together in such a way that it gets clouded. Here we want to look at it single threaded, which is why I did that. I want you to listen. Parametric estimating for schedule means if I have a house and I want to put 15 windows in it, which I did in the last few years, 15 windows. What am I going to find out about the schedule? Why do I need to know that? Well, somebody's got to be home when you open your house up to 15 windows being put in. So schedule is an important factor to the stakeholder sponsor of this project. And here's how it works. How long does it take you to put a window in? And are there different schedule parameters depending on the type of window? So if I have six of these and eight of those, and that's 14 and one of this other stuff that I'm not even sure why I'm doing it now. What is the total of schedule that you can give me? What's your estimate? What are you estimating based on those parameters? So, parametric estimating. It happens the same way with cost. You may be more familiar with it with cost, but schedule is desperately important with project management. And we sometimes forget that people will talk about, well, it'll cost you this much, but we forget to say, and how long will it take? When do I need to be available? Or when do other people need to be available for you to do this effort? You say it's going to take two weeks. Is that contiguous weeks? Is that dependent on somebody else finishing something before you come in? Are you handing this off and have to have someone there to sign a piece of paper before you leave? All these factors are important and all these factors are part of successful project management. Three point estimates. Everyone does this. Everyone thinks this way. Three point estimates are about the most likely Worst case, best case. Do this all the time. I took two cars to the shop in the last two weeks. When you take your car to the shop, you, you, I always, and, and, and yes, I am a project manager, so maybe I do think this way weirdly, but most people that I've talked to also think about What's the least amount of money I can spend? What's the most amount of money I can afford? And what's the most likely that they're going to charge me for? And can I get out with that? Three-point estimates are based on that natural instinct. But instead of going by your gut and being paranoid, which I probably was when I went into the, the, the shop, what we do is we ask people, we go, okay, what's your best guess, least amount of money, best, you know, most amount of money, most likely. And we just take those three and we do a simple add them up, divide them by three. Very simple math. With PERT, 
People have decided, mathematicians, engineers, people far smarter than me, had looked at this and they said, you know what? The most likely thing to happen should be weighted more. Meaning that if you are looking at three cars and you go, I love to have the Jaguar. I really don't want that small little, no. But I'm most likely going to buy a Ford, a Chevy, whatever. Then what you're most likely to buy should be weighed heavier. It should be thought to be more important because you have expressed it as more important. And what they found is, is mathematically, when someone says this process could be a million dollars or it could be a hundred thousand, but it's most likely going to be around five hundred thousand dollars. If they looked at it and they warped it a little bit, because they're doing estimates now, estimates, and they said, let's weigh, meaning we'll take into account that most likely estimate bet more than either the high or the low, it will be a better estimate than the pure three point. Because someone may say a million, a hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, the three point may skew it. The pert doesn't. Why? Because they take the most likely and they weigh it higher. They give it four times the weight of either the high or the low. And it gives you a better estimate. You can do this in every estimate that you do. If you think it's going to take you, if you think it's going to take you a year to do something, and if you, or lowest it would be two months and your middle distance is six months. You take two months, year, six months, times four, divide by six, poof, you have an estimate. It's tried and true. It is part of the methodology, part of the standards, part of the understanding of project management. Now, understand it's not always accurate because it's an estimate, but it's a good method. It's mathematically sound. And I say that with all confidence. It's mathematically sound. If you have accurate information, all estimates are based on the accuracy of the source. So never forget that. And in the three point and the PERT estimates, because people are people, they are the ones that can be skewed if people know what method of estimating you're doing. I've seen it happen and I warn you of it. It is part of the methodology, and the reality is if you have good data, you have good information. It's, 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 it is mathematically sound information. Group decision me methods here, are, we're, we're talking about how people come together and they decide on, on how long things will take. And this is uh, privy to how people deal. Uh, if you're dealing with people who are very good at and very knowledgeable about the situation, it, it's, it can be, it's absolutely great. Come together, how long is this going to take? Let, let's figure out what the, the scope is. Here's the work breakdown structure. Here are the... Um, activities that I'm trying to do, 
how long do we think this is going to take? And you talk to people using that expert judgment that we all have, and you come up with an answer. It doesn't always come out, but it is a great method of doing it. Remember, our techniques are not always used all together. They're used where appropriate for your organization, for your project, etc. Our estimate technique examples, a little more detail now. We've talked about analogous estimates. Find a project, a phase similar to your project or phase, and use it. It's top down. It's like looking at things from the top to the bottom, from the, the biggest picture to the smallest. If you have a huge project, this usually does not work real well because there are too many specialty things in there. But when you're looking at something like going between a uh, conversion or an upgrade or something that's normal, it has a regularity to it. So analogous uh, estimates can really help when there are very little change from one to the other, except for the normal change. It, so it, realize that this is a top-down type of analogy. We have parametric. I will read the slide. If each window takes six hours to install, then 10 windows take 60 hours to install. It's simple algebra. Parametric is algebra. Here is the three point. Optimistic, pessimistic, most likely. What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best thing that can happen? What is most likely? And you divide by three. PERT estimate. Take three points of re reference, optimistic, pessimistic, and most likely, but here we weigh the most likely more. So it's optimistic plus the pessimistic plus four times the most likely divided by six. So when we're looking at optimization of, of resources. And here, we're not talking heavily resources right now, but we deal with it. Here's an understanding of how resources and activities can come together. And we have three different activities, four different resources. And how do we level this? Well, what's the problem that we see in this scenario? We see that reference four is, has more of the activities assigned to them. These could be viewed in hours, days, weeks. It really doesn't matter the scale. It matters what you see balancing different references. Why? 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 Because everyone has 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most of us work 40 hours a day. If your organization works differently than that, then that's something to take into account. But we don't have an unlimited number of hours. So we have a choice. We look at referent, uh, resource four. Are we going to do what we're saying we're going to do? So he is so overwhelmed with the type of work a and we have no understanding. I, I heard it, I heard it. You're like, you haven't told us what the activities are. And sometimes we know, and sometimes we don't. 
So, resource four has a lot of activities. Do we want to balance that? How do we balance that? How do we look at this and make this work for all the resources and the company to optimize the leveling? Now, some of you are probably rolling your eyes at me, and that's okay. But understand and understand that optimization of your resources is key. If you use your key resources too much, it will be detrimental to your project over the long haul. So, what do we do here? We look at it and we balance things. This is just a graph. The point is not the graph, but that you understand that if you over stress resources, they are not without fault. They don't have a propensity to not fail. They may go somewhere else. They may do other things. Understand that when we're trying to manage a project, we're trying to bring the best people together and we're trying to keep them together. One of the elements of change that we don't talk about very much is the element of change within people. People change, their lives change. And since this is people doing projects, we need to keep aware of that. We need to keep our minds open to it. It tends to be conversations that are, that are happening in the hallway, for lack of a better way of putting it. But understand, when you're dealing with resource leveling, you need to understand who's doing what and how to put the best person to the best place without overwhelming any one person. Standard deviation, this is a statistical way of looking at things. It becomes pertinent when we're looking at certain pieces of project management, and it comes out of the idea that we, uh, project management, some of the fields are dealing with how things are built production-wise, the big thing to know is that these statistics, 68.26% is one sigma or one standard deviation. Two is 95.46, which is two sigmas or two standard deviations. Three sigmas is 99.73, and the six sigma, the meaning of that for most people who use it means that you are approaching having all the errors out of your code, your product, etc., is 99.9997%. It's not perfect, but this is what mathematics says for us. This is the standard deviations, and it is used in our testing of your qualifications. So know this kind of numbers, but you don't need to understand anything but the basics. It's not a math test. So, 
The standard deviation is P minus one over six. The variation is the sigma squared. That's basically what we're talking about. These are the mathematical ways of relating that information. The variation is between it is a statistic that when you use it, you understand it. Or if you're not using it and you hear it, you have a place to go and look for its understanding. It, for the test, variance is the sigma squared. That means times itself. Now, let's develop the, sch the schedule. Our inputs, schedule management plan, we know that one. Activity list, we have the activity attributes. Our project schedule network diagrams, our activity resource requirements, our resource calendars, our activity duration estimates, our project scope statement, our risk register, our project staff assignments, haven't seen this much yet, it means who's assigned to what, our resource breakdown structure, see what I did there? Initials, our enterprise environmental factors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We get tired of looking at them when we think about this in terms of the whole scope, but they're important to keep in mind. That's why we add them here. Think about them. Tools and techniques. Schedule network analysis critical path method, critical chain method, resource optimization techniques, modeling techniques, leads and lags, schedule compression, always love that one, and scheduling tool. Our outputs for this process are our schedule baseline. Let's take a moment there. What's a schedule baseline? It is the schedule that you've committed to at the beginning. You've said we have looked at the work that needs to be done. We have looked at the schedule possible to get that work done and we have made a schedule according to that, those factors. So the schedule baseline is important because it's part of the triple constraint. Our project schedule, which is the schedule baseline in brief, our schedule data, any data around the schedule, any clarifications, any parts that are taking the schedule and blowing it out any, in any way. Our calendars, another name for schedule, etc. Our project management plan updates, our project document updates. Now, Techniques. Here's one for putting a lot of information together and making sense of that information. It's the critical path method. This is a method of compartmentalizing certain pieces of data so that you can make a educated analysis of the critical path of your project. Here's the pieces of data that you need to understand. Early start. 
That means the earliest date that you can possibly start a certain activity, you have duration. We've talked about duration before. It means how long a certain activity will take. Now, we should have an understanding of how much resources it takes to do that activity. And that should be embedded. Here, we're looking at it as a pure activity without the resource load on top of it. You have early finish, EF. That means the earliest date that something could finish. If we started it at the early start, it lasted the duration, and we finished. Below, we have the critical path methods way of looking at late starts and late finishes. Here, we look at the late start. We are looking at this activity, this duration, and the late finish. Now, you may think I've, I've skipped over the float and slack type elements. The, the point is, with this method, what we're trying to do is compare if things work perfectly between point A and point B. Point A is the early start, point B is the early finish. If things work perfectly between them, then the early start, early finish would have a duration described and there would be no issues. What we have here is if there are, what happens? If the early start and the duration do not come out to what you thought was the early finish, then what will happen is our calculations will cause us to understand that we're behind, that we haven't been maintaining our critical path. When people, typical corporate organizational people talk about critical path, they think it's what we have to absolutely do. It's important. I've heard those words. What the critical path is, see the slide, it's the longest path through the least amount of float or slack. So, I will show you a way of looking at this that says this plus this equals this. If equal, then this moves down. If not, then this moves down, and it may be more. Then we subtract from the late finish, the duration, to the late start. If there are float or slack on this activity, then we note it. When something is a critical path, we're not just looking at one task through this project. We're looking at multiple, multiple, multiple. And what we're saying is we need to be able to understand which of these paths, these critical paths, I use the plural purposefully, which one of these critical paths is the longest path through with the least amount of float or slack. Float and slack are the same thing. So, we calculate it. We add the numbers. Which ones? If I add the early start plus the duration, I get the early finish. If I say this is the earliest we can finish and drop it down and go backwards, we find more information. 
if the early finish and late finish have a difference or the late start and the early start have a difference. Now, that means that the numbers aren't the same. If you subtract one from the other, you get a different number. You get a unique value. Then there's a float. There's some slack. And we need to be aware of that as project managers because we need to understand where our project can be compressed, expanded, what is the, the problem with it. Now we're looking at the critical path method. And the critical path method is we build those blocks of time that we've looked at. And here we have a matrix with duration and dependency. And that's in important to understand the difference between the duration, which is how long a task takes and the dependency. What's it dependent on? The blocks down here show us that relationship. A starts on day one. Three days, day four, it ends. On day four, B and C begin. They are dependent on task A. When B ends, it'll be ta on day nine. Day nine is transferred over in this way of looking at it. In five days, it's day 14. It's transferred over. Task D is done. Five days later, H is completed. And so what we have is on day 19, we have the completion of this task task F. Now, when we run this backwards, it's a forward pass and a backwards pass. And what we're trying to figure out is what is the longest pass through this scenario. This is a simplistic example, but we see that we go backwards and we end up having that the time here, this is the float or slack time is higher. This is lower. Why is that? Because if we ran down here first, we would see four plus 10, 14, 14 moved over, plus 10, 24, 24 moved over, plus nine, 29. So the, both the earliest finish that this can have is 29 days. Why? Why? Because I could finish this path, B, D and E in 19 days, but I can't finish this bottom path, C, E, and G until 29 days. So this is the longest path through it with the least amount of float. Well, where do we find that? Well, it's because we do this. After we go here, and find 19 can't go there. We go here and it's 29. Because that's the earliest start that task can have. Earliest. If it starts on 19, it won't work because it's dependent. H is dependent on G and F. It won't work. So what you do 
is you work backwards. And when you work backwards, you find out that this path is the longest path. C, E, G to H. That's the way it works. It's the critical path because it's the longest path through the project with the least amount of float or slack. You can't deny the realities as long as the facts are valid. So, leads and lags, different piece of this, but here they are. A lead is when a task is planned to finish earlier than is required for a dependent task. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I am trying to finish something, and I know that it only takes me a couple of days, you know, I, I can do it in a couple of days, I'll do it. But no one else is ready for that for later. For whatever reason, you could have dependencies, you could have other things going on, you could have uh, a number of situations that would have people not be able to take control and move the project forward. And remember, we're trying to move the project forward. We can't always do it, but that's our goal. With the leads, you have a lead. It's like, ah, uh, I'm going to come over and cut down your tree. Now, I know that the person that's going to cut up the tree is not going to be there for 10 days. But in your project plan, you can put down that I cut down the tree on day one and two. But they're not going to clean up the mess until later. Now, that that's a silly thing, but we all heard of it. We've all know that that can happen. Someone will ha do work when it's available to them, but we are not able to react to that work until later. We can't fix any problems they may solve, or, and that's too big a word. We may not be able to react to it until later. Lags? A lag exists, and I will read, when on completion, the, and there is a, a, a planned delay before the next task can start. For instance, big lag, if I pour concrete, there's the reason I brought it in early, and I will finish. I'm pouring concrete, takes me two days. Poof, there's your concrete. It takes a number of days for that concrete to cure. And while it's curing, you can't do any work. So there's a lag between when I complete my task, I pour the concrete, and when you can begin your task of finishing the framing or whatever. So that's leads and lags. Now, why are leads and lags important? And why are we talking about them here? Because in scheduling, we need to understand what activities naturally lead to leads and lags. And when we get more into resource planning, we'll see where resources may be available at one date, not another and what other resources, not just human resources, but other resources like, I don't know, forklifts, cranes. They're, they're, those are resources. We'll look at those. And they can cause us in our scheduling to adjust. Adjust. We're looking for success. I start a day late and I finish on time, or I don't. I don't finish on time because 
there are other problems. But these are factors that we wrap into it, wrap into our schedule. We're trying to figure out how to make this successful. We know what to do. We're trying to figure out how to do it. And we're, we will figure out who's going to do it, which is both a human and non-human resource problem. Here's a special case, and we, we talk about schedule compression. And this is one of those project management only things. It relates directly to how we plan. We need to understand how we plan so we understand how we possibly can compress A and actually compress B when it becomes necessary. We have crashing. This is about adding resource to a task to bring it on schedule. You crash a schedule, you throw people at it. You make people be the parameter. If you say, I only need one person, I'm going to add five. And can I get it, instead of a week, get it in a day. Sometimes that can happen, not always, but it, it is a technique that we use in project management to be able to control the schedule, to balance things. Sometimes we use it in the course of managing a project. Sometimes it's just when we plan it, we talk to people, we go, well, give me three people, then I can have this done. It, it is, crashing the schedule is usually a compression technique that associated with being behind, but not always. Fast tracking. If you have sequential tasks that can be done concurrently. If you have two things that can be done at the same time, meaning I am building a house. I'm building a house that has, um, that has plumbing on the inside and electricity on the outside. Don't know why. That's okay. Normally, I don't have that situation, so I don't think about it. But I'm a little behind. And I realize that the plumbing's on the inside, the electricity is on the outside. I wouldn't bring those two staffs in together because they may step on each other's toes. I have no idea. It may be that they can't be in the same space at the same time because of physical confinements. But if I can put one on the inside of the house and one on the outside of the house, I could fast track this by bringing both of them in at the same time. One working inside, one working outside. And by the concept of fast tracking, we can get these types of activities done concurrently. That's what fast tracking is.